You gotta have it right yeah. up in your mouth, Michael. It's not up. It's, it's not up in there. It's not. It's no, not it's one working. fist away. It's one one fist like, right there. One <laughs> fist. One fist. <laughs> Yeah, one, yeah, half a, like a LaCroix can away from you, your face. I think we've already entertained the people. I think we're good. Like that, that was well, the show. <laughs> that was the show. Thanks for joining us this week. Next time we'll see you. We're going to bring Paz back. Yeah. yeah. <laughs>what's up guys it's justin Kahn, your favorite founder's favorite founder today we have a very special episode we've got the entire justin tv founding team back at it again found founders collective i don't know what our, our super group is called um these are you know some of the smartest people out there in silicon valley who are now doing the biggest things and uh this has been much requested. Like everybody wanted to see like the four of us get back together, all the, all the fans. And I finally made it happen. I've, I've shed blood, sweat, and tears to make this happen. Or at you least sent one, one, message. one message. Yes. Sent one message. Uh, wait, but Justin, are you really, your, your new thing is your, your favorite founders, favorite founder. That's like your new slogan. That's what I've been saying in my YouTube videos. I, it's okay. what I landed on. Okay, you, I, mean, I love the incredible. Everyone needs a slogan. <laughs> Everyone is. You could think of a better one for me. I like. I. I. Uh, you know. I. I'm, right, I'll, I'll think about it. We'll see you. You know. The, see if I can what figure was your it out. slogan on the exercise bike? You had that thing. My exercise bike work slogan real. was. The core is <laughs> solid. The core. No, no, that was that was my core. first first username. The core is sick. Decade. It's my Facebook. The core is sick. My, yes. My Facebook name. If you type in facebook.com slash, do they still do the personal URLs? They like facebook.com slash the core is sick. We'll go to my profile. So I was doing a lot of ab workouts at the time. Fitness is the first step to greatness. Uh, I heard that so many times. Yeah. I can't really claim that anymore because I'm, I'm not, uh, you know, I'm never filming while I'm working out now. Yeah. You know, the other Um, thing I was trying to remember and cut this, if this is, if this is bad, but we used to spell our name, like there used to be passwords that would be like the first letter of all of our names, but what order was it in? Do you remember this? Where there used to be a password, oh, it was uh, like- K-E-M-J. K- was that like the password to the yeah, Wi-Fi K-E-M-J, or something? Yeah, K-E-M-J, that's right. And then it was no, like no, it was like the root password to our servers. Like 605 or something. I hope someone changed that. Oh, no, it was it. All, all of the code is out of production, thank God. But uh, <laughs> I'm pretty sure that was like the that was how you like logged into all the like yeah all the actual stuff that was running. Are you sure TV. that was the right order though? Are you sure it was K E? It was definitely yeah, K E M J. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, yeah, would know. Like right. muscle memory, right. we typed that. Like, yeah, totally muscle memory. I typed that. Up. Yeah, totally. What, wasn't absolutely it like K M J six o five or five o six or one? Yeah, of like, it's oh, like where we lived, right? It was our apartment number. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's it, that's just we're like those fucking top security right there. <laughs> we're like those Must old like those old people whose passwords are like their child's last name and then like their birthday, like yeah, like that's it's that's the that's the kind of level of security we had going on. Oh man, um, there wasn't much to protect back then, anyways. It's true. We'll tell. So let's. That's a perfect segue into how to get started. I, I solicited the internet for questions for us. And also my producer came up with some Jen. Uh, and one of the top ones was just like any unheard stories from the Justin TV slash Twitch days, the crystal tower days. That's what people want. They want that, that, uh, early, you know, startup war story dirt. What have you told? I, mean, I don't have time up. to watch your show, Justin. So, like, what's old? <laughs> you don't don't tell don't tell me that. I know you're watching my TikToks. You sent me TikToks screenshots take of my like TikToks. thirty seconds. Yeah, it's a different story. I told the I told the one about how Michael found um, how Michael Michael uh, got a hold of you by sending a pizza guy in like 2008. Remember when you were in Tahoe? And I think that one has like hundreds of thousands of views on YouTube now oh, that's great that one that one was popular i, was just, I remember no, the guy who just... found our home phone number yes uh, which one well i mean there's there were several but particularly the one who kept calling and michael picked up the phone and very generously just talked to the guy for like hours repeating to him over and over and over again i'm so so, I'm so sorry, sorry for you, for you. I'm, I'm so sorry i'm so i'm this, so sorry this was back I'm just when so we, so we... sorry 
Yeah, this was right when we had launched the show, Justin TV. So we're streaming the internet and people wanted to interact and they just kept calling. And Michael, you just kept talking to this guy and saying, I'm so sorry for you that you would waste your life calling us. I'm so, so sorry for you. I'm so sorry for, for quite a while. It was a while. It was a while. It was, but I think he got the message. I don't think he ever called back. <laughs> it's like kindness of endurance. Mission accomplished. Mission accomplished. I just Absolutely. had to prove to him that I was willing to waste more time than he was willing to waste. That's true. And because you didn't have that much to do right around that time with Justin TV, like you won. <laughs> he had to go to a job. <laughs> I mean, I could have yeah. been watching Scrubs, but other than that, it was... <laughs> no, this this was your job, actually. This Doing this yeah, was true. your job. Actually, that makes yeah. me, that reminds, that reminds me of, um, you guys remember this? I wrote about this in, in the, this book I'm writing. I've I kind of wrote this scene up uh, when we're all sitting around, this is in 2010, at Michael's apartment in the Avalon. We're all sitting around brainstorming what Google is going to ask us uh, when we uh, go. We're trying to sell the company desperately to Google so we can like make some fucking money. And we're sitting around there and we're, we, were, we, we were like, Michael, you were the one who was like, we need to prepare because <laughs> I think you knew intuitively that if without proper, deep preparation, we're going to be fucked walking into Google and being like, we're smart, you should buy us. And uh, so we were like writing all the questions that we thought that they could, um, they might, might possibly ask us out and then like coming up with like whatever credible answer we could think of, right? And I got this call from a, a user who had been banned from the site uh, and, and I took it, like while we're having this meeting, I took this call, I don't know if you guys remember, and, and he's like, you know, you, you, hey, is this Justin Khan? I'm like, fuck I sh you know i knew i shouldn't have picked up an unlisted number and then i'm like yes and he's like i want to be unbanned from justin.tv like you guys wrongly banned me blah 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 and i'm like okay well i'll look it up what's your username oh, yes. Yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> and he's he's like what's it's your username a, a a n a l underscore l u b e underscore I N V A D E R. <laughs> and I'm just like, like, like I'm kind of, kind of like oh, a blast. I'm like, well, anal <laughs> lube invader. And then he's like, yes. And I remember putting on speakerphone. And I, at that point, I'm like, okay, I got to wait. I'm going to put you on speakerphone because my other people from our team are here. And we just, I need to confirm this anal lube invader. And he's like, yes. And, I'm, and I remember saying like, you sound like you're like a 30 year old man. Is that, <laughs> is that right? And he was like, so, and I'm like, so you're just saying you, you're calling me. Your name is on our site is anal lube invader. And you're calling me that you're seriously called me on Saturday afternoon to get a, an unbanned. If you just say that out loud and I'll actually unban you. And then he, he actually did. And we, un, I did unban him actually. I don't know whatever happened to that account. Maybe it's still active on Twitch today. Oh my God. I, I really sincerely doubt it. It would also run afoul of our new, uh, uh, you know, invalid username policy uh, pretty, Fair. pretty strongly. Um, he would have a forced name change showing up. Um, the uh, Someone, someone the... check that. <laughs> I remember a different version of that story. So um, I remember that we, we wanted to sell the company to Google and they agreed to buy us for $30 million at the time that seemed very generous but we had to go through interviews and i remember uh emmett is both the villain and hero in the story so i remember saying to emmett emmett they probably don't care about all the business people <laughs> but they really want to interview the engineers and so you should like take the engineers through a normal set of google questions that would get an interview so that like we will do well and Emmett looked at me and he said, uh, some version of like, go fuck yourself, right? So like some version no, my, of like, no, they're what, fine. What? We don't, we don't, they, they, they're good. We're not no. going to have a problem. No, no. I think what I probably said is like, I don't know how to do that. I mean, I don't remember if I've said, pronounced it in those words, but no, like, you definitely I don't know it. what no, like. Go to go fuck yourself. Fuck yourself. <laughs> I'm sure that's true. Now what I would say there, there is like, you know, I've never interviewed with Google and I have no idea what they're going to ask in those, in those yeah, questions but you could just and no ability to prepare the engine. 
So actually, I went further. I Google searched the sites for you that I right. just didn't know what the questions meant or what the answers meant, but I kind of knew that you knew. And all you had to do was look at the sites that I gave you. I don't, re I don't remember that. Clearly not. And I believe, and I believe so, you. I totally uh, believe you. And so then- And it we turns out you saved us. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, that's a hero villain, right? So villain, we interview and Google comes back and is like, yeah, we don't really want to hire, like we want to hire Emmett and Kyle. <laughs> but, <laughs> And like a couple of other people, but they're like, we, you know, we would like for an Accu hire to hit this like 75% of your people pass. And we're at like a third. And so um, go fuck yourself. And uh, I remember at the, at the time being pissed at you, Emmett, but you know, it was a genius move in the end. It worked out. It, it worked, worked out. out. It definitely worked planned. out. Very much planned. Ve Sorry. I forgot. Very much I planned. I wish that I'd like, I wish I remembered this better because I wonder, I wonder what was going through my head when I was like, no, we shouldn't prepare for the interviews. Like that sounds stupid. We, we but, really had this like existence proof thing going on, right? If you have a website with a lot of traffic and a lot of users, right. you couldn't be an incompetent engineer and cause that to exist. I think the team right. had like a lot of street smarts engineering experience, but not a lot of academic smarts. So we couldn't pass the Google interview, get interviews as a group. But we could keep a site up with, you know, tens of millions of monthly right. users and at a cost lower than anyone else. So we figured out how to do that. But, you know, there's different criteria for hiring teams into Google. Well, and we yeah, were maybe it turns out the YouTube, Google interviewed. Yeah, we were bigger really than matter. YouTube Live at that time, right? Like we were bigger than them, yet not qualified yeah, yes. to run yes. our own website, I guess. <laughs> 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 to be fair, when we when we sold Kiko to two cows, I showed them, like we showed them the thing. We're like, yeah, one of the problems is getting like continually like, to get getting slower and slower. And he was like, hey, okay, like the system and like guy who goes in and starts poking around. He's like, yeah, these queries are really slow. Have you have you ever vacuumed the database? And I was like, vacuumed the database? Like, what are you talking <laughs> like a, about? A Dyson? Who do you like, what, yeah, what do you what do you <laughs> vacuum in a database? What do you what do you what do you like? I because I never took a if database class in school the building? Like, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Like I, I like do I do I like print the database out and like run run a vacuum over it? But it turns out you have to you really have to vacuum your databases or they it doesn't like you have to like it's this meta metaphor for like cleaning up all the the data that's been sitting around your database for a long time, um and, and sort of recompacting it to make it more efficient. And I uh I just didn't know about that. And we were running the website and so like it is I'm just gonna say not totally non credible the people who managed to build something might be also incompetent. Because I've, you know, the I have been yeah. that man. The funny well, thing about that was that he he vacu ran the vacuum, which took like thirty seconds because yeah. it was like you know no data a hundred thousand rows in our database, and and then and then it, it sped up like a hundred x, and it was the queries like we had all, done all of this engineering on the application side to try to make it faster and never vacuum the database, and then it was just like instantly the application ran perfectly. Yeah, it was super fast. So we actually built a very good application. We just like, didn't actually know what we were doing. So I don't know. Do Did you, you guys hire that guy? I don't know what that. No, we probably should have. Instead, I, I learned about about vacuuming databases, and I started reading about. I realized there was a lot for me to learn, and. I actually, I actually became a pretty competent database admin by the end of uh, by the end of the time I stopped doing doing coding. It was kind of fun. I kind of missed that. Um, yeah, you're pretty good at that. But let's play this forward. Had Google bought Justin TV, I yes. think we all would have been fired within 12 months, both for like or personality quit. styles, styles yeah. not not wanting to be in there, or just like performance evaluations not not meeting muster i don't think it would have would have gone well we were we were too off like in our own way of doing things which is effective but not orthodox in any way shape or form no it would have been the worst thing that do... would have ever have happened to us would we've ever wanted to commute down there too like can you imagine going down to san bruno is that san bruno like every day they had a pretty cool yeah, we would not like have... a rock climbing wall one of those like treadmill rock a, climbing walls that could have kept me wall. occupied for like three days <laughs> no, but it was super easy. It's in their lobby. No one ever used it. It was uh, the handholds are super big. It's like one of those things. It's like bait for for new hires. It's like, hey, we're so cool, and then like you don't really want it, you know. You don't know what's on the other side of that wall, like inside the office. I'll <laughs> show you that. <laughs> yeah, actually, you know, a famous Silicon Valley investor, Hunter Walk, was the person who interviewed me. He was at 
he was at YouTube at the time. He had transferred over from Google, was one of the transplants over. And um, he was interviewing me about all the things that we could do on, on YouTube Live. And I don't think I did very well in that interview. I think I kind of disagreed with almost everything he said, which in hindsight probably didn't help us either. But. Although, although in hindsight, you were, you were like correct. I don't even remember what but, he said. For all I know, he could have been correct. I don't even remember what he asked. That's true. <laughs> I don't want to take any Accurate. credit. Like... <laughs> so, I mean, all right. So, so, go ahead. I was like, the, uh, uh, I feel like that's been a general story, which has been like almost every deal that's fallen through for me has turned out to be a blessing and surprise in, uh, in disguise. Like, we almost got bought by Yahoo with Kiko. That would have been a terrible terrible thing to have happen to us uh the google deal would have been bad like uh i'm even really glad like the like generally more deals should fall through i think you're almost always better off like not doing it if it's not like it's if they're not really down, excited yeah. yeah well no it's also like if they're not excited enough to do the deal like it, it doesn't if they're not so excited it, like gets across the finish line the deals that fall through are generally falling through because it actually it isn't a good fit and like you are better off. You actually are better off. Be and I think it's actually connected. I don't think it's like random entirely. So if we go back to stories, one of my favorite stories that I don't know if it gets told enough is when you got arrested, Justin, when we were trying to convince Kyle to actually quit school and work full we're time. We're reframing that as a recruiting stunt now. It's just contemporaneous. <laughs> no, no. Yeah, it was absolute. I was mortified until you looked kind of into it. And then I was like, maybe we could work with this somehow. <laughs> maybe maybe well, it's going to work hear, out. I want to hear Kyle's perspective because I did tell the story. I, I tell it all the time. I told it on YouTube <laughs> and it is one of the, the popular videos on the channel. Well, so they know my perspective of, you know, going live and getting arrested, urinating my pants in the, in the prison, like they, that, that part is all part of the public record now. Um, but what were, Kyle, what were you thinking at the time that this was going down? Well, I think, you know, at this point I hadn't figured out how to get the live video to record. So we were like watching it and listening to bits and pieces of this. And I was trying to figure out how to save the the video or hack that in because I figured something interesting was going to happen. But yeah, when I don't really know, I kind of figured you guys knew what you were doing and this maybe was part of some master plan um, <laughs> or not that big of a deal <laughs> until, until who were, no. who was, who were we driving? Who was it? Michael, was it, you were driving around. We we're trying to find Justin, like which jail he's in. Yeah. We were in a fucking yeah. tax and Justin, had got arrested. Follow that car. Follow that police car was what we said to the taxi driver. Yeah. Yeah. Not a lot. I'd like at that point, I hadn't really reconciled what was happening. I wasn't worried about the fact that our one and only prototype camera that we were going to build a business on top of was with you and perhaps getting like kicked around in the bottom of a police car or that you might actually go to jail and we also wouldn't have a business. None of that clicked then. I mean, at this point, you know, the idea of Justin TV being a real business was not a thing because we were just messing around and prototyping that was pre launch. And so like reality hadn't set in that, uh, there's like responsibilities and, and uh, you know, downside if something breaks or someone disappears. You know, Kyle, I kind of feel the same way. I don't think the reality that we were running a business occurred to me at all at the time. <laughs> I actually, it, it was far more enjoyable than I think it might have appeared if you were to hear the story. It was like, oh, we have something to do tonight. Let's chase Justin around jails and see if we can find him. I hope yeah, the camera's really fine, actually. That oh, night yeah. didn't seem so distinct from the other nights in terms of people getting really drunk and mistakes being made. So it didn't really stand out. I, there you go. I well, just was... remember that night. That was the first time I was like, we have something here. Like that night actually was a little transformative for me because as I was getting in the taxi to follow Justin from being arrested, I get a phone call and it's my friend Daniel from college. And he's been watching the beta because I sent it to him. And he's like, did Justin just get arrested? And I was like, oh, this is kind of magical. They're actually like, this is like, there's like a, this is like really, in, like I'm, and I was like telling you about what's going on. And I was like, this is like, like the live, like I'm at, he's at home, but he can see what's happening and he can reach out and like connect to me. That, that was actually kind of cool. 
And we actually didn't recapture, like we didn't recapture that kind of dynamic for a long time. But I, I, at the, at the time I remember being like, this is, this is actually a thing. Like this is kind of, this was kind of fun. Um, well, I don't know about that. As weird as I think it was. we captured it pretty well when we got swatted. That's, that's fair. It was, it was a little bit of the inverse. <laughs> the, the, the cops come to you instead of you coming to them. Cops. You had to have the, uh, a full police experience, Justin. You had to have a 360 experience of the criminal justice system. Uh, yes, oh, yes. Every right. aspect. I that I posted it on YouTube as okay. a short also. I've been posting. I'm don't worry, I'm mining heavy I'm mining the content library he, very heavily. I made That's a good. I made a TikTok where I green screen the video and I kind of talk over it and What's happening? They can't, I mean, so the TLDR, they kicked in our, someone, you know, a fan, an overzealous fan calls in a stabbing in our apartment. They kick in the door because it's like slightly ajar, by the way, always close your door, then they have to knock. And then they uh, point to have their guns drawn and you're like sitting there two feet away where they have a gun loaded Glock pointed at your head, which was very off-putting. Yeah, you I know? remember that. Really not great. They did, they did actually really love knock. that. And they said, SF police open up. And it sounded like Matt Brezina, our friend. And I thought he was just yes. like playing a joke on us. So I open up the door, kind of swing it open fast like you would to like greet a friend. And there's literally a gun like drawn pointed at my face. I like took me up for hours. I was like visibly, physically shaking like the rest of that night. That was intense. Yeah. 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 That was, that, that was shocking. I remember we discussed like afterwards with the aftermath. We're like, I was like, should we shut this down? Like this is, this is. This is real shit. That was like the scene in a movie where, you know, we I have a come to Jesus. I'm like, what have I unleashed? Like my friend could have and, died. And, and then you're like, nah, it's fine. We'll just keep going. It's cool. <laughs> well, basically, we 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 you know we were fine the next morning. I think yeah, exactly. Next next morning, back at it. Okay, so 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 I wasn't there, which was great. <laughs> I was, Thank you. I was somewhere else with someone else. And so I remember coming back in being like, oh, well, that sounds like that sucked. <laughs> yes. I probably right. should have moved yeah. my desk from closest to, to the door, like, you know, to, five to the feet furthest from the that. door. <laughs> never, never occurred. Yeah. Anymore. You had a good 10 feet there, Kyle. You could have got a little 10 feet away from that gun next time. <laughs> 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 All right. So how what's about, how about you some... not told, Justin? Like, what, what, what can we mine here? Like like features we built that never made it, or features that were oh that were like pivotal. You should tell them about that because I feel like a lot of these like people treat, keep trying to recycle these ideas. I mean, yeah, challenges was a was a good one. Challenges was was the that was the project that taught me how to be a product manager by counterexample. <laughs> like, tell, explain what it was. It was explain what it was. So, challenges is idea that you could create a challenge for a streamer and it'd be like a sort of like a you know like uh sing sing this song on stream or like do 50 push-ups or whatever and the streamer and you could like have them be upvoted and there'd be like popular ones and you could be like requested to do one and then the streamers could like take them and then and then do them we'd automatically clip the challenge being completed and everyone could like vote on which of the clips of the completed challenges were the best and like uh it sounded like kind of like it could be fun and cool and like it would be good and it didn't occur to me at the time to like ask, did it meet the need of any of our streamers? Like, if I, did it, it wasn't general. I, mean, I, I actually, I did talk to, so I didn't not talk to streamers about it. I did talk to streamers about challenges and they're like, yeah, that sounds cool. But it turns out that like, they'll say that about anything. That's like not, that's not evidence. Uh, and, and we launched it. It was like this, it was we put a lot of work in that. We we're like, this is going to be the big thing that makes this TV much more fun to do. And it was just like a total failure. It had like so many actual... pages and corners of this feature. All these things you had to build. All these different views and, and like oh my settings God. and all that kind of stuff. It was. It was and a, we built it was like all a of them. Full site. Yeah. Yeah, we built all of them before testing anything. That was that was great. But then and, and I, think I think there was only one challenge ever completed, which was like one I did. Yeah. No, th there was more than that. There might've been like 15, but like, yeah, it's not, it, it wasn't used. It was a real failure. And I don't know, for me, it was this real like rite of passage of like, I was so sure this was going to work. It completely didn't. And it really shook me up. Like it made me really reconsider, like, how am I, how am I doing that? Like what, what made me think this was a good idea? Like I need to completely change my ways. I guess that was, that was my like product manager come to Jesus moment of like, this is, I've, 
I'm 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 living life wrong. Yeah, but you did a better it, version oh, of that with gamers. You actually like listen to the users, and that worked. Yeah, it was definitely did. It definitely did. Eventually, I learned how to do a little bit better. What, what, Michael, what were you gonna say? Yeah, let's not lie here. Like the the moment where challenges died versus the moment where Twitch was born, there was still like years of incompetence between those two moments. It wasn't like... challenges. When did we build challenges? It was one it's of the like first. Two thousand seven. Yeah. No, it was, it was 2000... not two thousand seven. No way. Yeah, it was at the end of two thousand seven. Like, because we launched the site for everybody. We launched my show in March 19th, 2007. Then we launched the site for everybody in October. I think like yeah. in the early October. And then I think it was our first feature. I think we spent several months in like kind of end of that, that year building it. No, because we'd, we'd, we'd iterated we'd... several, like lots of stuff before that happened. I, I let, let's see. Justin TV. No, challenges. no, I think we did a lot of the things afterwards. Like we built the social network afterwards and chat afterwards and... Oh, there were friends. Afterwards. We had friends on that site. We had friends. And yeah, followers. we both friends. Yeah. What I yeah, would friends and followers was confusing. Yes, that was confusing. <laughs> what we were good at though, <laughs> we did remove challenges completely. Like I think, like we, we actually did. completely removed it from the site, which was didn't it take too long? It wasn't up there for months. It's just this like decaying fragment of the site that was like half of all. But the that's politics. fast. Yeah, cutting right. something after months is fast most people will take like i actually think that that was something we were pretty good at was being like oh that well that was a mistake and then just like not doing it anymore there was Which, a concept you know, can generate of justin some tv but there, there's like justin tv time where things that now seem to take product teams like two years or this is maybe startup time like yeah. a month to launch and then two months to kill whereas like large companies today that could take years or, or never happen so that was really cool That's totally I, I, true. I look back fondly on like velocity of stuff we tried it and failed I don't regret that because I think it would have taken cycling through like 20 bad ideas to find the one good one. You know, yeah. one I think I also remember one great feature was one that Tim Robinson made. Remember when he made subscriptions? That was like yes. a feature that saved Justin TV. Pro. Justin TV Pro. Oh, Pro. Yeah. Sorry, Pro. Sorry. Yes. Yeah. yeah and yeah. I remember it because like it was a secret feature. Like we launched a secret feature that was a third of our revenue. And basically, if you were in a non-English speaking country, after watching Dustin TV for, was it five minutes or 10 minutes? We, we just tested the crap out of it. Wait. And the optimal yeah. length was five minutes. It was just a paywall. And it was like, screw you, you got to pay us 10 hours a month to go to our site. And like, that was a third of our revenue for like years. And nobody ever knew. Yeah. And it kind of gave us this idea of having a subscription at all. Right. Like, yeah, that, that was that was like the seed of like, you know, this this really powerful idea, which, you know, inspired subscriptions for channels and then now has inspired like subscriptions all over the Internet as people have like kind of copied the subscription model off of Twitch in the in the Western Internet. So it was all because of Tim. So Tim was this engineer who like uh, he just like didn't he thought we were like incompetent product managers, which was basically true. true. And, and he just wanted Accurate. to work on like without without interruption in his like loft like we had this like jigsaw S like it was kind of like an mc escher-esque office and there was this loft in the corner that was like one person he was working out of and he just wanted to stay there and not hear from us ever basically so we were like okay run with this pro feature because we don't like you know, it's like, we don't know anything about it. Like we're, we, I tried to like tell him what to do and like make a spec and stuff. And he was just like, fuck this. And then he just did, did it. And he just, it worked. It like, he iterated, I, he actually AB tested, he iterated it and it actually started working after months. It was the first time we'd ever done AB testing in our company. And it was him. He taught me what AB testing was. It was really impressive. Yeah. Tim, I, uh, wherever you are, I salute you. Thank you. Yeah, we're, we are grateful. Uh, I, uh, uh, I think the, the other feature that I remember building that we were so excited about was the like go live from the front page. Like we had this idea, we we're going to pivot the front page from like finding content to creating content because we need to be a social media service, oh. like all the other social media services and everyone Caleb, else like Caleb came up with that. Yeah. And we, we are obsessed we were, with funnel analysis. We're like, if we get more people yes. to broadcast, we'll be a bigger site. So how do you like force people to broadcast? <laughs> and, and like, oh. we, uh, 
yeah, we, we, I, the other thing I remember is like, so the thing we run just we ran Twitch on like from the very beginning was like this combination of like, number of hours of video watched and the number of unique daily visitors and sort of the ratio between those two things. And that was like, that's like basically the, those are the two things that sort of tell you what's going on on Twitch. And what, uh, on Justin TV, we, we couldn't measure neither of those numbers. We had no real measurement of the number of uniques that like was in any way trustworthy. And we also didn't have any measurement of like how many hours of video were being watched. And so like we, up until like sort of towards the end, we eventually built that capacity. But like, I look back at it and we were like, we were looking at video views, which is like the single worst metric for managing a video website, because every time your, your video goes down, people hit refresh and you get more views. <laughs> and so like, literally it was like, we would like fix quality of service issues and our site would shrink because we'd have fewer views because, uh, mm -hmm. because we were so that incompetent about measuring uh, usage. This is pretty incredible. I really can't believe how successful it was. It just goes to show like, if you just keep, if you, it, it, this Kyle was, Kyle was saying, it's like, if you just keep moving, you just keep like doing dumb things, but then doing another dumb thing and then another dumb thing and you keep, and you do it fast. It's like, can actually work. Even if you start off pretty dumb. What were some of the, what were some of the worst moments? that you guys remember from the entire experience or maybe the best you could do best and worst. Mm -hmm. Ooh, I remember one. I remember Justin's worst moment, top five, Justin worst moment happened at the dining room at the Ritz. Remember oh, that moment? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do. I do. That was that was that was a worst that was a worst one for sure. That was like we had we were, were we were pivoting, right? We had decided to pivot to social cam and to Twitch or what became Twitch, right? But it was just unnamed ga gaming, you know, working on the gaming category. And so we were like on the sprint, right? We were like a it was like a three month sprint to like launch these things or whatever. And um for some reason our investor one of our investors, I'll just like, it doesn't, we don't need to blow, put it on blast. One of our investors wanted us to take, take us out to dinner at, at a nice dinner. I'm not even sure why or how, but we were working like a lot. It's kind of like what Kyle said, where we're like, we were like, okay, we're working. The team was like working, you know, 12, 13 hours a day, six or seven days a week. Like people were working all the time. And so I was like, okay, I, I, I didn't want to go to this dinner, but we were like, okay, we need to go because it's our investor. And so we went with all of our uh, significant others too, like all of our yeah. partners. And he brought um, some girl he was partner. dating, some, some woman, woman who was dating, yeah, partner who was dating. And she was, I was like, at least, I kept thinking, well, at least I'm going to get a nice meal out of it. He's going to, you know, he's, we're going to get a nice meal out of it. And then, the only thing I remember from that dinner of, in terms of what we talked about, which is funny, was that she kept talking about ayahuasca and how she was puking, but it wasn't the, and during this ayahuasca journey she was on, but it wasn't the bad kind of puke. It was the good kind, which was like, blew my mind at the time. At the time, I, I wish if I had been a little more curious, things might've been different for me, but I was just so enraged the entire time. I remember it came time to pay the bill and I look over at Michael and he's like picking up the check with a company card. And I mean, I was such a tight fisted asshole that I was just like, what the fuck? Like my mind like was going, like my eyes were going red. And uh, I don't really know, how did he slip you the bill? You know, uh, when the bill came, I looked directly at him and he looked directly at the waiter and then looked directly away. <laughs> and for the moment, right? It was like, well, uh, this could either get really awkward or I, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to take there the There we are. But just to pose that yeah. to the first time we went to Dining Room at the Ritz, after raising money from an investor. That, that, that was an all-time, like, best life experience. That was so much fun. Yeah. One That's of the best it, meals it, of my life. For, the first time I'd ever had, like, a real multi-course fine dining experience. And it was with like a bunch of we took out a bunch of our friends and like it was amazing i want to say we spent like a, uh, like a one percent of our of that, our fundraise correct. on that right yeah 
I think it was no. 20 grand and we raised 2 million. No, That's fuck you. Right. No, it costs like $3,500. God. Oh, okay. No, right. only point, <laughs> only, only point point one five. <laughs> yeah, that's nothing. Oh, really? Nothing. Never mind. Really? No. I I thought it was a uh, I thought it was more than that. Well, I'm, I'm so happy to learn. I was I carried around this like, wow, we were really irresponsible, but apparently we were only no, like we were... mildly irresponsible. Thirty five no, thousand dollars for dinner? That would have that would have been aggressive. Been I aggressive. thought it was twenty. No. no, it was two. You're right. It was thirty. Th th that's right. It was like three to four thousand or something like that. That's a deal, actually, because we had like. 12 13 people 16 sorry now people. we really sound like assholes yeah 16 yeah. people 16 people it was a, it was a big celebration we didn't we didn't eat like that yeah normally it was after a long slog of trying to raise money too it was like definitely a celebratory moment i thought we got a good deal at the time like now yc companies yeah. raise that you know when they when they when they have a good bowel movement but back then i felt like we were really lucky well, we were actually two million because we raised two million at like a ten million dollar pre or something like that, which is like a really good. Was at the time was like excellent. Like other people were not getting that, you know. Can you imagine venture rounds being in the range of like a valuation being in the range of like five million to twenty million was our like a really good one compared to today? Like there's seed yeah. pre seed rounds where the valuations are like five times that. I talked to a company today that's raising a, their Series A and the valuation. You know they have they have. Uh, they have sub $1 million in ARR and the valuation is just under a, a hundred. So, you know, it's like, oh, dude, no, no, no. That's not the record. One of our dude, good I'm friends. not even saying it's the record. I'm not saying it's a record. It's Tuesday. It's just a Tuesday. <laughs> Fair. One of our good friends invested in a company's seed round at a $1 billion valuation. I passed on that one. $1 billion valuation for the seed round. At a certain point, you have to just think about like what's the what's the terminal valuation of this company, and is it you know like is it worth the risk? That's Could as, be I told the I told if we're talking about the same company, which I assume we are. I talked to the founder, <laughs> and I was like, "Can I explain you my math on angel investing? Like, <laughs> I'm looking for like a thousand x return or like a ten thousand x return. Like, you need to be worth ten trillion dollars." <laughs> To make that worthwhile so as much as i love what you're doing not for me <laughs> yeah. global, like yeah. what's the global economy what's what's the big number here <laughs> i hope this company so I, becomes worth 10 trillion dollars because that would be a great I, absolutely too, hey kyle the global gdp is apparently 80 trillion so it only has it's to just... be one, worth one eighth of all of everything produced on earth well, totally I don't want to blow up this company's spot, but they that would be a rational argument if they succeed. Yeah. So, there you go. So that's the, go. hence the hence the valuation. Yeah. I, so I just looked up challenges, by the way, and uh, it was 2007, but it launched at the very very end of the year. So it's it, it, you know we really it was, they launched in like December of 2007. Um, so you guys are, must be right. I I remember challenges being this like real touchstone for me, but it must have taken me a long time to like to realize because. I remember when I was doing Twitch, thinking back on challenges and being like, we need to not do that again. And I think I, in my mind, I'd compress the time involved. It's so interesting, like hearing it, like the, because we did have that whole year where we did nothing but work on money. Yeah, and then, the money, that, that was a good year. That was like an actual, like we were the customer. We were like, we need money. And so, we, <laughs> and we met every month. That was like actually good product management, right? Well, yeah, yeah. if your goal was to get money, because we met every month and we were like, how do we, or even just good management. We were like, we have a, a list of expenses and we have a list of ways revenue, or we, we have a column A, like ways to make money, column B, ways to sp spend less money. And then we just put things on the list. Like everybody just brainstormed shit to put on the list. And then we rank ordered it in terms of ROI. And then we just did as much as we could. And we went from, this was like 2009, I think, right? Yeah. yeah, I think 2009 or 10, 2010. Yes. And we went from not profitable, like deeply unprofitable to cash flow positive in 10 months. No. That was, no. I mean, it was amazing. No, no. We went from August 2010, burning $250,000 a month to we ended 2000, 2010 with a million in profit. So under- Yeah, over the whole, whole year. No, in under that, two that, months, that we, was, went, we went from two months to death to a million in profit. In, in what was that? That was like five months. That was great. 
Yes, that's right. That's pretty intense. That was a great. It's amazing what scarcity will do to you. I remember we had like we had this printout. I don't know if you guys remember this, but we like ordered all the pages on Justin TV by views. And there was like the front page, there was like the directory page and others. And then we look at each one of those pages and say, all right, we've got banner ads everywhere. Can we insert another pre-roll video ad here? Even if someone doesn't watch a video, can we just make a pre-roll and start playing a video without them clicking? Yeah, we, did. We, we innovated on that ad format. We really invented the like autoplay ad that is really video that's really there to show you to show you a pre-roll format that's now widely used on news websites and i'm very sorry to everyone but sorry. we did invent oh that. yeah and do you, yeah, do you remember is, yeah. when i can't remember who came with this me and it was probably you but like when we're like these stupid broadcasters like when people log on to their stream they just keep going like it they, they, so we only get one ad showing and they're like okay well let's like start inserting timed ones like every five minutes you watch pre-roll and they hated that so then you know we're like well what if we I think you came up with this in, in, uh, innovation, Emmett, or I'm going to give you credit for it. What if we let them run the ad when they're like going to the bathroom or something? They can type slash ad in the chat room and run a pre-roll. And then that was that was the start of that feedback cycle where if we incentivize the users to like run ads, maybe the whole thing takes off. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah, that was that was for we invented that for Twitch and like the the that was like I think that was the key insight that we never really had during Justin TV. Like the most important one actually of everything was like, oh, the streamers are actually important. Like we actually have to like give like they're not just like like gonna do a bunch of labor for us for free if there's no benefit to them maybe we need to like cut them in on the deal and like once you do that it yeah it empowers all kinds of shit like that uh it was that was a that was a big change looking back at it we really like didn't want to talk to the streamers like we did a little bit but like it was really like we had this idea we were building a social media thing like uh you know whatever facebook or something and we did like that meant you didn't like talk to individual customers. It was very important not to do that because that's like not automated. And I feel like that's that was sort of the mindset I had. Well, also had, like remember, the Google mindset, right? Like that we're just yeah. gonna like spit out some product that you know everybody is like gonna be like, this is fucking genius. Like these guys are like the smartest fucking people ever. And and then that was it. That was the whole product development process. Remember these customers, these users were also getting us sued somewhat constantly. So not all of them. No, just, just the most popular. Yes, just eighty percent of the most popular. <laughs> I remember there was a two-year period of time where, what was it? Sergio Berlusconi's company was suing oh, Justin God. TV. And Emmett was named in the lawsuit because like an idiot, and I learned this lesson through Emmett, he had registered the website, I think. <laughs> so I had. They just threw his my name, name was on the... So Emmett couldn't go to Italy for two years because they the cops might have picked him up. And uh, I just remember chuckling about that and thinking, you know, that's one of those things where that was rolled the dice whose name could have been on that. <laughs> <laughs> really could have been anybody. It really could have been anybody on that. <laughs> oh God. What else happened? I feel like we're missing a couple. Well, oh eight. Do you guys remember the Moroccan guy who started streaming soccer? Like the first real sports broadcast we ever had? I don't. No, so, what was that? Spring 2008 a guy in Morocco set his laptop up and pointed it at his television where a local Moroccan league soccer game was playing. And 3,000 Moroccans from around the world descended on our site to watch this game in Arabic. And we had no idea what was going on and it totally crushed us. And then in 2008, we grew 1,200%. Like I'm, that year was just, or it might've been 1600%. It was just like that year was just scale and like, hold on to your ass. Uh, that was that was one of the more fun times. Challenges was one of the last features we built because <laughs> even though it's in 2007, after that, it was like scaling so everything doesn't fall apart. And then existential despair and depression so no one was doing anything. And then, uh, and then, oh shit, we're gonna run out of money. 
and then pivot. Yeah. Like we didn't actually build we, any more we, TV features after that point. No, we did build some. Remember, we built like an, uh, the feature where there could be like co streaming, like multiple people would appear on one thing, on like oh. together. When did we build that? Or did we build it that. or did we just mock it up and not build it? I think it. we, built it. I think we, we just like mocked it up and never streams. built it. Two video streams actually loaded within it. I actually we might even supported like up to four. I can't remember. Yeah, I think I think Kyle's right. I think we built it and then just never really understood why people would want it or like how to they would use it. And also the latency was like variable, right? So like the streams yes. wouldn't matter. Really, you couldn't really talk. You know? That's why we killed yeah. it because you couldn't talk. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So the, the the soccer stuff, like, yeah, that was an intense period of time. Because I remember, like, the simple like, today, if you have a scaling problem, you know, like pay CDNs a lot of money and the problem goes away. But like live video on the internet was way too expensive, like off by like 10x from what we could afford. Yeah. So we did it all ourselves, which is very painful trying to like build a CDN on the spot. But I remember that during that, shortly after that soccer stuff, there was a period of probably 18 months where I had normalized going to bed and then like waking up at 4 a.m. whenever like the traffic would spike in, in Europe or, uh, or Africa. Mm -hmm. and like spend an hour and a half to two hours battling server fires and then like pass out that was like every single day seven days a week for like 18 months well and, and there's, no, the there's no time to ever get ahead of it because we had to maintain the site so we couldn't like we didn't have the bandwidth to like hire people or to like expand the team or to like do pay off tech debt it was just like you know we we're stuck on this treadmill when did we and hire shipman oh yeah that was pretty 2009. early shipman was like 2009, or, uh, 2008 was like 2009. looking Looking back at it, I think Kyle, you did a bunch of things that were really important for Justin TV, but maybe the single most important thing you did was hire Shipman. Because he no. actually knew No. 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 <laughs> Bill also built the video the system. And the video Bill, built the camera and the video system. And, no, and like hiring, the website. <laughs> hiring Shipman like uh was of equal was in that list because he yeah. actually like he's the reason we built out a like we then were able to, on the basis of what Kyle had managed to like build himself with blood, sweat, and tears, turn it into something that could have a global scale. And like that was like we like were never going to figure that out ourselves. Actually, like that was not that was not something we had the experience to know how to do. The thing that I remembered about Kyle, and it was actually funny because like working at YC now, I get really confused because I kind of felt like being with Kyle and Emmett. I'd never heard anyone say, I don't know how to build this. Like those <laughs> words never left their mouths ever. Right? And maybe Even there was evidence have, maybe. all around that they yeah. didn't know how to build it, but those words would never. And so like, I remember being early at YC and like talking to like a technical co-founder and I just kind of thought like engineer, engineer, right? Kyle, Emmett, you guys hire good engineers. So like I'd only been around good engineers. I remember the CTO being like, I don't know how to build that. And I just remember having this deep feeling of like disgust, just being like, those words would never, like Kyle and Evan would never say that. Like they'd rather slit their throat than say, oh, I don't know how to build that. To build that. And, and that's what I, I learned. That. I was like, oh shit. Like they weren't average. Like that wasn't average. <laughs> But I think until yeah. I interacted with other technical co-founders, I didn't realize like. It's kind of crazy when you go into other places and I'm sure you feel this way, but I mean, you know, Kyle and Emmett, you both are running like large companies, like, but like you go into like teams that maybe work for you or, you know, I've done this in startups or, or other startups I look at and then like they make a roadmap of how long it's going to take to do things. And you're just like, wait, what the fuck? Like it's a web you're putting up a application like a restful application like that should be like one week or like two weeks or something. What it was taking so yeah, long? Totally. Like it's like six months or something. You know? Yeah. No. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. The, I mean, they, they yeah, may there, be trying to budget we, for the time. Go ahead, Kyle. I was just saying, there's things that you know we overlooked, like any sort of tests whatsoever, uh, any sort of scaling plans, uh, you know, documentation, user testing, these little reliability. Details. Yeah. Yeah. Eagle. No, yeah. So you delete everything from the plan except writing the code and it, it happens pretty quick. Yeah. And I actually think this is, this is a, this is like a secret that startups, a secret advantage of startups. Like we could build stuff and like try it and find out if anybody has any interest in this thing very rapidly because we did skip all of the, you know, yeah, the security, like whatever. 
Like they, nobody wants anything we have. Everything is terrible. We might as well just go build something and see what happens. Uh, yeah, so I, I, I found the uh, the email where I found the, the when the challenges happen. I just want to share because there's one thing in it that I, really, that I also saw that I, I think is amazing, which is that we had in our list of things to do at the end of 2007 to build a cell phone application that we thought might be a good idea for for mm -hmm. Justin TV. That was a that was like that seemed like a maybe cell phones. Maybe that's maybe that's gonna be a thing. I don't know. It's on our list. We have we have checks two boxes too, more than most of the stuff. It's amazing. Love that. Um, another question, like, what do you, how, do, how was our working dynamic as a team? Well, yeah, I, I love this one because there, there's, I feel like there's a lot to learn here for people. Like how, what did one, one thing that, uh, one question here is like, were you ever scared about losing your friendship as a result of business disagreements? I think this is best illustrated in the story when we were all living together and the working dynamic was so bad that Kyle had decided to switch from sleeping at night to sleeping during the day, which to this day is like the most boss move I've ever seen for like, you know, this isn't working. So I'm just going to go nocturnal. So I don't have to be here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to like uh, wrote a lot of code. I mean, like, yeah, it's yeah. Kind of, was, I'm not going to argue. Time. I'm not going to argue that like we were anything but massively dysfunctional. But at no point was I afraid that I would lose my friendship over any of that dysfunction because, like, I don't know. I just felt like we were con we connected. No matter how much like ir how irritating it was that other people were clearly wrong at work and how dysfunctional that was. Uh. That didn't mean we couldn't be friends. It was just like, oh yeah, that, that well, I guess that's that's stupid. There's like a deep foundation of friendship underneath the uh, the dysfunction. Because I think that while we while we would be very, it was very dysfunctional in the sense of like uh, making decisions. It was quite functional in the sense that we were all in it together. Like at no point did I feel like someone was trying to screw me over. Not that's once cool. did I question whether or not anyone else in the group was like trying to do to like. Uh, to the degree they were putting in effort, the effort was going towards making things better. They might be putting in not enough effort. They might be like, whatever, like, like, uh, uh, working really hard in the wrong direction because they're an idiot, but like, but they weren't like trying to like sabotage me or screw me over. Like at no point was that a fear. I think that's like a really big deal. Like there was, there was a deep integrity and trust in that. Um, I don't know why, like. A lot of companies that have, I mean, we, we know, I guess we all wound up going and doing our own thing eventually. We're all happier being CEO than like being part of a team. But like, I, uh, I, I guess like the, uh, we had a surprisingly functional four person leadership team, like in the sense that it was functional as that like it functioned, like we in fact ran the company and grew the company and did stuff, no matter how dysfunctional the interpersonal dynamics and management practices were well the management practices were incredibly dysfunctional we we, we uh as well as well <laughs> i'm as so sorry making. i'm so sorry to all all of our first employees like we were we really it's enough to make you think maybe somebody should have to have a license to like hire people like yeah. it was it, we were just so incompetent we were so bad we we're such bad managers had no idea what we were doing. But I mean, it was also a constant war of attrition in terms of like who got to make the decision. Cause like Michael was the CEO, but like we didn't actually, you know, he wasn't making the decisions like a CEO because we weren't, wouldn't let him. Right. So we were like, and we all, for the major decisions, it was kind of like we'd sit in a room and argue until like people gave up basically. And then it was kind of like a last man standing thing, which I think some of us were more like intellectually stimulated by. And, and I just remember Kyle was often just like, what the fuck? This is fucking stupid. Well, you guys were pretty open about it. Being from Yale, you're like, this is what we do. We argue. This is, yeah, this to is the point Yale. of submission. Your grade is dependent on it. You know, yeah. really, it like your grades high, are dependent on it. It was high minded debate, it wasn't argument. And, and the best part was we never wrote down the decision. <laughs> so, like, it was, it was, if in you, the Michael, if you, <laughs> if you write down the decision, you can't argue it again tomorrow. <laughs> like that's why would you write the decision down? That's fair. That might reduce the quantity of argument you could have.
the quantity, excuse me, the quantity of high-minded debate available. Um, what, what I think actually made it work is that we all respected each other and we all had the kind of our areas of ownership and like Kyle like owned the video system and like I wasn't going to, Kyle had some plan for the video system. Like, fuck if I knew what that plan was actually in any detail, but like he probably was on top of it. And like, like Michael was like going to go like raise money. And he, I, I like didn't even go on the fundraising meetings. I don't even know. I didn't even know what was really happening. I was more or less in the dark. And that, the fact that we were all willing to like trust the other person, just own their thing. It was like there was a invisible good CEO have, that actually delegated to us areas of ownership and was like, right, these are your areas of ownership. This is what you're going to go do. Except there wasn't anyone in that seat and therefore everything was massively dysfunctional. Yeah. I think you're being too generous. I don't think we trusted the other person to do the job. I don't think we wanted to do the other person's job. I think that we 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 weren't confident that they were doing a good job, but we didn't want to do the other person's job, or in my case, couldn't do the other person's job. So it was a weird, like, it was a weird balance of power. I don't, it wasn't like a you, no, it was more like a, like- <laughs> Mutually more, assured destruction. Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but not not I, aggressive, I, you know. But but certainly not functional. Yeah, I I kind of see it more like Michael, where where there wasn't there was trust. I think, like you said, there was like integrity trust. Like everyone's work, we're on the same ship, and we're kind of pulling roughly in the same direction. But I definitely think there wasn't as much trust in the like. And I think I was probably the most guilty because I had like just enough technical knowledge to be dangerous, and like did you know just enough on the business side or whatever. And I thought I was like on the product side. And so I was kind of like in all these different areas, but I think I was, we would have been best off. I think what breaking apart shows, like everyone went on to like, you know, do things like Twitch, like was your idea. And then you like became the CEO and like shepherded, right? Like Kyle, like went on and founded Cruise and like created this massive, you know, self-driving car company and, and like so on and so forth. Like each of us, I think wanted to be the CEO but like we didn't really have the feel like the moral authority to like really step up and like just be that the CEO. And then the other people weren't really supportive of it. So it was kind of like this quadumvirate or whatever you would, you know, call it where we all just it was a quadumvirate, you know, yeah. Yeah. So, which is what not a form of government that? you hear about a lot for a reason. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, but what but was like, the what, 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 magnetism that kept us like together through that, right? I think my, I think it was like, I, well, yeah. Go ahead, Kyle. Go. I, I think it was uh, we had set ourselves up in a position where we uh, were basically unwilling to ever admit defeat. Like we didn't have fallback jobs. I don't think any of us had families at the time, and we had all done things or taken bold moves where failure would be an embarrassment. And so there was that common ground. I think that was helpful. And I just remember at no point in time did, like was giving up and shutting down the company and doing someone else, something else like a thing that was never even an option that was discussed or contemplated. It was all, how do we get ourselves out of this mess and on to the next one? So that was an interesting yeah, I mean, concept. Because like today, that's not common at all, or at least maybe, you know, like in, in the, you know, how I work today and how I interact with people. But yeah, we, we yeah that's, that. I think that's true. There was like a huge, for me, you know, there's like this huge amount of ego keeping me going and also but also in a good way like the good part was like i was you know like you said i was like oh i have no option but to do this and my whole identity is tied up in it and even like when we vested we all vested our shares right like four years in we were still like working on it because we we're like this is our thing this is our shot this is you know my baby or whatever yeah. but then the bad part of the ego like for me was like i had all this ego about like oh i should be in charge and making decisions and like deciding all this stuff and like be the ceo of a company and I, that's my, you know, that's what I'm supposed to be because like I had this whole vision of what your like success is in Silicon Valley when, you know, I'm not a good CEO. I like, I should not, or I, maybe I could be, but I just don't want to do the things like a lot of the things that you should want to do. Right. Like, it's like I, there, I should have just specialized in the thing that I wanted to do. Right. Like, and, and not had ego be the, yeah. the bar but the ego for me was a big barrier. So I, I've seen a lot of leadership teams now because I've built a bunch of leadership teams. I've scaled a bunch of leadership teams. And I just think, I don't think you guys are giving us enough credit for this core thing that we did right. That is the reason why there was any success at all, despite what I don't dispute is massive, horrible dysfunction in many other areas. How many times have you seen a team you're managing 
where someone's like, that guy's doing a shitty job. And the reason we're not succeeding is him. We need to get rid of him or like give me more power because that guy sucks. How often do you see that? And like the answer is all the fucking time. That is the default thing that happens when you divide power between people. And uh, and there's a lot on the line. They start making excuses about how it's not their fault. It's someone else's fault. And they start like trying to to they agitate yeah. to like remove other people or like like and like not once can I, I can't think of a single time where that happened with us the entire that's time. true. I can think of times where people that's... like intervene and like Emmett, you're fucking up like directly to me, but not like behind my back. I'm not trying to get me removed. That's true. I, I think that you're right. There was like never any, there was always like trust, like that uh, trust is the building block, right? And then there was never any, nobody ever was like deflected, blamed directly, or like tried to be like, I'm not responsible. I mean, there was like kind of the passive, like the four of us are responsible and though I'm like not responsible and I'm lying to myself, but there wasn't the like something bad happened tangibly and then everybody, someone was like, oh, it's like that other guy's fault. That was not me. That's I'm not responsible for that, you know? I'm going to play negative Nancy, Emmett. I, I, I think we got lucky on two fronts. I, I actually think that, one, enough things were happening in the company that we were constantly confronted with challenges. And so I think the company stayed interesting. It, it wasn't like, it wasn't becoming successful necessarily, but it was staying hard. And I think we all kind of got motivation from that. And um, I think the second thing is the part of that, like, fuck that other guy thing is like, comes from, I think I could do a better job than him. Yeah. And I don't know why, but like, I don't think any of us ever really wanted to take that step because I don't think any of us wanted to do the other person's thing. Like, I don't. Like, I remember for the longest time, I didn't feel comfortable being a product person. I was like, I don't know this shit. I can't write a line of code. I, I can't do Justin's job, right? Kyle and Emmett, that's fucking like off the table immediately. And so in a weird way, I think that we all kind of had this, like, we're on the life raft together and like mm -hmm. the waves are coming every day. And so like it or not, we got to figure this shit out. And like, I think a bond was formed because of that, that was a very strong bond, but in a different environment, maybe a different, something different would have happened. Well, hold on. That's, it's, that's totally this true. is like a perfect example of survivor bias, right? We're like grasping at trying to figure out the secret to success that we figured out. I mean, probably just dumb luck and perseverance, right? Doesn't that sum it up? <laughs> that's, that's why yeah. success, Kyle, but why mo having like seen startups go through YC, you have four person co-founder, company what are the chances four years later all four are still there and still engaged yeah how often that's is that that's a third dimension whatever that is it's not just uh, luck and perseverance you're right yeah there's there there is something about how we engage with each other as leaders of that company that made a quadumvirate the least good form of leadership like stable enough to like not just fall apart which it normally just does and so i don't know what that was but i think it's I think it's something around this deep trust bond, despite the like all the decision level dysfunction on top of it. Well, put you know, one thing I will say is all of us had hero moments. I think mm. all of us disappointed each other in some cases, but all of us impressed each other in some cases too. And so that that probably had a big thing to do with it. Um so if you were to go back and give yourself advice, like see senior year of college or in Kyle's case, sophomore year of college, <laughs> again, like, would you tell them again, like, go do a startup? That was like, that's, the, that's the path. I don't know, man. It's been, it's been pretty rough. <laughs> for sure. For sure. No, I would definitely say do a startup, do a startup because like, you, I got, even without the outcome, I mean, obviously got, we all made it, which was incredible, but even without the outcome, I feel like it's been such a learning opportunity. Like I, sometimes I take for granted, like what a tremendous learning opportunity this whole journey has been to be able to, not just within like the context of startups and then business and investing, but then actually because 
of, of this tremendous success curve, being able to access people who, who are like at the top of the game in all these other areas and learn from them, you know? And I think that to me is like the biggest gift, you know, just being able to like, even like, so, you know, my pivot to like wellness and like focusing on the intrinsic, I think I've been able to have like these amazing teachers and like opportunities to learn because of the success side, you know? And, and so I, 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 for me, it's like, oh, worth it. Even though it was very painful, I think it was, it was definitely worth it in this journey. It's why I don't regret like having Atrium like, and just blowing up, you know, incinerating $75 million. Like I learned so much about myself through that process. You know, you didn't incinerate all 75 of it. That's true. Most and and a bunch of people got legal services at a discount price. <laughs> yes. Yes. The market was served. I don't know. What do you guys think? Would you, I mean, other advice yeah. or like, would you do this again? I mean, obviously it worked out, but like Kyle, I'm curious, like on general principles, sort of knowing what you know now, do you think dropping out midway is it was like, like an, on average, a high percentage move, or do you think it would have been better to like stay all the way through graduate and then, then start a startup? <clears throat> I think that was a, for me, it was a better way to, to get into it than graduating. Cause I think, uh, had I graduated and there's a lot more attention on what you do and a lot more pressure to make a reasonable decision mm. or had I like waited until after I'd already like joined a company and had like a stable paycheck and other things. Uh, like the, I think, I think like for me, that point in my life and maturity was a good time to do it before I had a chance to the like developer lock in any other habits. So I would say yes. Um, and what I've learned about myself since then is I really like starting companies and creating and, uh, and I think I'd have a hard time, like, you know, having a, a regular job. Yeah. I definitely, Cheers, what are, like, yeah, go I ahead. Say, looking back at it, like, uh, if I was going to start a startup, I'm very glad I did it immediately after graduating, not like waiting. I'm glad it wasn't like, oh, I'm going to go work for four years at Google and then start a startup. Like that would have been a big mistake. If I was going to do it, it was right that I did it. Why is that? I think it like builds bad habits. You learn all these things that like, that are true in your, that context and untrue and you have to unlearn them. And I, I think that unlearning is always like five times harder than learning stuff. Something is. And so I think I, I'm glad I didn't have to unlearn any bad habits. I had a lot of good ones to learn. You know, I was thinking about this. Michael, do you have an answer? Well, I was thinking about the idea. I wouldn't change anything first. No, I, I, I love this question when like I get it from college kids. I'm like, I'm talking to you all now and I'm filthy rich. God forbid I changed one minute and the outcome changed, right? That would be <laughs> the dumbest, dumb, like the, the, like the parallel universe, Justin and Kyle and Emmett would just be just, just laughing at me so hard. <laughs> so no. Um, <laughs> One thing that I've been thinking about, though, and I love you guys' thought on this, is like, what was the best version of ourselves? Like, I've told myself a little story about each one of you in terms of like, what we were then and what it turned out to be the best version of ourselves. And I kind of felt like, you know, Justin was the inspirer. Like, I feel like that's always been the best version of Justin. I feel like I didn't realize that Kyle turned out to be the entrepreneur. Um. In my mind, Emmett, you turned out to be like some combination of leader and like strategist. Like, and I felt like I turned out to be a teacher. And it's like weird how like we all like were co-founders and like we were all CEOs, but then like we all ended up being kind of different. And and like I remember a conversation with you, Kyle, last year where you were like, Oh, like, you know, I already have a list of other things that I know one day, once I solve this whole self-driving thing, <laughs> like, like I'll work on next. Yeah. Small problem with self-driving. <laughs> Another 10 years I or so. Yeah. thinking to myself, like, oh my God, like, I'm pretty sure I'm never going to start a company and you, 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 there are still problems in the world you want to solve. So like, that's my four parts. What are your parts? Like critique that. I think that's right. I'm, I'm curious, actually, I was curious to ask you guys, like, what have you learned through this journey about yourselves? Because for me, you know, one of the things I, 
I learned, I learned a lot like skills wise and obviously became an expert in startups and investing, but I think I learned a lot about myself and like my personality. And I think for a long time in the startup world, I, you know, when we were working together, especially I was like, Oh, I should be an entrepreneur. I should be a, but I should be really an executive. I should be the founder and CEO of this company and like, or a company and build something really big. But it's kind of like, I didn't really want to do any of the things that that entailed, you know, I didn't like love doing those things necessarily. And like what I love doing, like you said, is like, I love the, you know, the inspiring part or like, um, you know, getting people catalyzing things, getting people excited about things, learning about new ideas. Um, I'm like the world's greatest hype man, you know, and like, uh, there you go, Justin, like, you got your slogan. It took me so I'm Justin Kahn, world's greatest hype man. That's there you go. World's that's greatest hype that's, man. That's that you just nailed it. And I feel like it's it's uh it took me so long to realize that about myself. Like, what do I actually like doing? You know, and what what gives me intrinsic joy versus what do I just think I should be doing? Um and it's weird because you don't usually think of should as like, oh, I should be an entrepreneur, right? Like most people are like, I should like stay at my job at Goldman Sachs or I should be a doctor or a lawyer or whatever, like their parents told them. But for me, my mom was an entrepreneur. So I was like, I think I had it in grade. I was like, oh, I should be an entrepreneur. And that's like, uh, you know, it's something as I've only really recently realized about myself as like my highest, you know, what I'm like actually good at and what I like doing. Emmett, I mislabeled you. You're the product person. That's what I meant by leader slash strategist, like product person. Like you, you, you yeah. ended up being the best product person out of all of us, I, which is I weird because I, I feel like it took you so long to apply your brain to that problem. And then when you did, it was like, oh, okay, well. Yeah, I, I, I think <laughs> that the, the big thing that I wound up realizing about myself that like, it took me many, many years to come to terms with because I had this, I grew up thinking I was like a, not an, like antisocial, like I was an anti, so I, I was bad at people and that like computers and systems made sense and they were safe and people were hard and I wasn't good at like solving people problems. And it turns out actually that's like, I, I'm a good programmer, but like that's a deeply incorrect like self image. I'm actually very good with people. I'm actually very good at listening. Um, I just, when I was younger, it was so important to me and so overwhelming. I couldn't like, I couldn't stick with it. It was like, uh, uh, being, trying to be present to that was so hard that I was like, Oh, nope. And I like, pushed off. And, you know, I think the big transformation for me was gushy going into management made me better at product because I had, like, I was forced into this corner of like, shit, I'm managing a team. I have to learn how to interact with people. And then I like that, I think shifted my self image enough to let me like call customers on the phone and like, listen to them and listen to their problems. And I never would have done that before. Cause like, I remember hard it was Michael for you to teach me to like, you can just call them for technical support. You don't have to find it on the website. It's okay to pick up the phone. And I was like, no, I will find it on the website. No, no, no. It's, it's we can, we can call them. And like, I finally like internalized like, oh no, I like talking to people. I like hearing what they have to say. Uh, and that was a, that was such a, that was a huge shift for me. Um, and I, yeah, I wish, I wish I had learned that earlier. Um, I also think like the Kyle, I don't know what you think, but I, I think like the entrepreneur, but also just like you, my impression is actually you of all of us get a lot of joy out of solving hard problems. Like I actually am always looking for the way to, to short circuit it. So I don't have to solve the hard, hard problem. So there's some cheat code way for me to achieve the result without the hard problem. And I feel like that's actually a fundamental difference where you actually want to like take on the actually hard problem, um, which is a little different. Like that, that's what you did at just DV. Like the video system was the one actually difficult problem. Everything else was like pretty much the run of the mill. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, we'll come back to that. But Justin, yeah, the hype man, I think is right. But also I remember, uh, I can't remember how you described it, Michael, but uh, Justin, you were like the, you were real talk. You were Mr. Real Talk. Like I'm going to pull you aside and have a, like a direct conversation and say the things that other people are not saying. And I think that was mm -hmm. like one of your superpowers. Uh, um, yeah, yes. Absolutely. But uh, now for, I think, I mean, you might've nailed it for me. I think the thing I realized is that I, I like, uh, I guess the best way to describe it is long-term compounding. So I like to take a really ambitious goal and then take like one 
baby step towards that each day. And I really appreciate that over long periods of time, uh, things that seem impossible, like, you know, they're basically a compounds. You bring more investment in, more people, more like ability to make progress. And that's, that's really satisfying. So like having a really ambitious goal and just like ignoring the fact that it's, you know, insane and just taking a step towards it. I mean, like work, yes, cruise is pretty ambitious, with even like these crazy fitness things I did on the side, it's the same thing. And that process every day, like trying to get a little better gives me a lot of joy. And once I realized that yeah. the process itself was a joyful activity and not just the destination, that makes it much easier to like sustain that for many, many years. Yeah. You're like, sense, that's man. like a, you're building. You're like, that's like, you're kind of like every day is you're building a little bit on top of, on top of the last day. I'm trying to build a little faster, a little better. So it accelerates. That's the exciting thing. Oh, I think that was, you, actual... yeah, go ahead, Justin. Oh, I mean, I would say like, I, I think for me, like it is that it was that thing of like, I like, I should have just like, I love evangelizing stuff. You know, I, I should have just not should, I mean, should like, I think I would have been a lot happier in the, my career if I had just realized that earlier and just said, Hey, that's okay. Like you don't have to build a product. Like you don't have to like do the, you don't have to build the product. You don't have to build program it. You can just go do the evangel evangelizing. And I think what you picked up on Kyle, which is the real talk part is like, I'm a very authentic communicator and people pick up on that and it builds a lot of rapper. And like, that's why my YouTube channel is like YouTube channel works, right. Or like Twitter or whatever. It's like people connect with me because I, I have a very authentic voice and I think that's because of, you know, how I saw my mom communicate when I was a kid, you know, or watch my mom. Yeah. I think I, I learned that from my mom at when, when I was young and that's, that's like, you're right. Those are like the things I'm good at. Like the only things I'm good at is like catalyzing things, getting people excited and having an authentic voice. So they like people, they're like, Oh wow, this guy's a real deal. You know, like I trust him or like, I want to work with him or invest with him or whatever. And so, you know, career wise, like, I now found the perfect set of careers, right? Which is like, oh, I could just do that on YouTube all day and on, you know, social media and then also monetize it through investing, right? Where like, it's, it's pretty crazy how many people out there are like, you, you, um, yeah, like many entrepreneurs are like, I want Justin to be part of my company in some way because I've like, you know, I've listened to him, watch, watch his video, or whatever. It's like, a, it's marketing, right? It's basically, and it's like a conversion funnel optimization. And, you know, I like to think I help in the back end, but so does many, so do many investors. And, wait, but it took me just so wait. long to like, accept that about my, accept that career, like that, that was like enough, you know, that I, my mind as is I blown. Today, it's like, yeah. My mind is blown. We had you in exactly the right job in 2006. <laughs> you were the talent. Yeah. Well, I, I think that it's, it's like, it's, uh, in a way, I don't think the I'm product that, wasn't good enough. The pro I think our product wasn't good enough, but like what I, what I, we should have done in Justin TV, if we were all like playing musical chairs was like, you know, you should have really done all the product, damn it. And, or, and, um, you know, maybe some combination of you and Michael, right. Michael Michael's like really good at product him, himself, mm -hmm. uh, in, in a, in a bunch of ways. And Kyle should have basically been the CTO of the company. And I should have just gone and like done the fundraising and like been the hype man and like not been in recruiting like in the office and just recruited people like been like, I think, you know, I think often like, oh, I should like, that's what I'm good at. You know, like that's why being a VC is a perfect job because it's like, it's all fundraising and then deploying the money and like chasing new ideas and meeting people and building rapper. Right. Should have run our social media. You would have been a better, yeah, well, you would have been a better fundraiser by far. It's funny because I now I'm I'm refining this in real time. It's actually preacher. You were the preacher. Yeah. Kyle was the engineer, you know, doing the hard thing. Emmett was product, and, and I was the teacher. And I and and it was funny because actually, in many ways, I felt like the teacher sometimes. Like, you know, I think that one of the cool things about being a teacher is you know when you're teaching a good class that the people you're teaching are more are like smarter than you like have more horsepower than you but like at that point they did like they're not ready to kind of harness it and your job is to make sure the class just kind of stays somewhat <laughs> functional <laughs> like, I, I do remember justin's pitch to me for like why we should bring you onto the team which is like we are not capable of like paying attention to something on a sustained basis and we need someone with like who's more of an adult to like keep us 
on target over time. And I was like, you are correct. <laughs> hence, hence bring Michael on to make sure we like actually would like uh, to stay on, stay on course at least a little bit. I mean, you guys well, did so build Michael, a startup you... and sell it. That's, I mean, That's, you, did. Yeah. you had something you, for yourselves. Kiko was a, if you think Justin TV was poorly managed, Kiko was a <laughs> whole was new a level. Liar. It was, it was, it was, I don't, I, I do not know of a worse managed startup than Kiko. I've never heard of one. No one's ever told me a story that like competes. It is, it was that bad. I mean, I guess the upside was we like, we got really good at building stuff fast. We got really good at prototyping. It was like a masterclass in prototyping stuff. But like as a startup, it was like. It was like our own Lambda know. school. Yeah. 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 That's right. Michael, what did, what did you learn about yourself? Um, that's a good question. I don't, you know, I feel like I don't have this great answer about a new learning. I think what the gift that you guys gave me by recruiting me was you know, my name in college was same day Seibel, right? Like I needed a gun to my head to, to do shit. And like you guys recruited me into a job where like by hook or by crook, like there were guns pointed at heads like all the time. <laughs> literally, literally, <laughs> literally, as we've yeah, literally about. sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that like my time at Just New was just like a reaffirmation that it's like, hey, gun, point a gun in my head and like, we'll we'll get through it. But like, God forbid, we're like safe. Ah, oh, this is this is kind of boring. And I definitely remember there were times where it's just nothing was happening, and I was just kind of like, I'm not gonna, I'm not bringing my A game today. But like, you know, testimony in front of the government, or like we're about to die, or like, you know, when we like stupidly when I invested our money in auction rate securities, like all those moments, right? Like. Or like, hey, the video system's down and we can't get Kyle on the phone. Like all those moments, it was just like, oh yeah, like these are these are the fun moments. And it's funny because now at YC, you know, like YC is older now. It's like 16 years old. Like the drama isn't the same. But when shit goes down, I still have this like, oh, all right, here we go. Like, you know, when, when COVID happened, it was like, oh, okay. Like we got to make some shit happen. And like, that's what I love. I don't know if there's any other job that just gives you that. Like, um, and I actually don't know that most people would want that, right? Gun to your head, right? Why, why is that attractive? But um, I don't know. That was, that was awesome. And, and, and you, it made me better at that. You ever consider emergency room doctor? I hear it's similar. You know, I rode ambulances in high school and uh, it was a little similar. Yeah, it was a little similar. Um, so anyways, so yeah, Michael, I, I hear you talk a lot about like, uh, what startups you like, you wish you saw more startups. And actually it's one thing I wanted to ask you, because I think it's like, I'm curious what everyone here thinks, but like specifically you, I feel like you have this point of view that like, you wish you saw more startups. I think we're not like the startup we started, which is like kind of this like social media startup or that's like in this, maybe Justin TV isn't a good example of that, but I feel like you want to see a new, you know, startups that are trying to do something uh, important. I was just curious, what do you like, what do you wish you saw more of in terms of like people starting startups now? Or what advice would you give people to, like, this is, this is the kind of startup I, I'd love to see now. You know, Justin and I were talking about this and what was the conclusion? The conclusion that is, I think I had a false conclusion. I think that what I thought I believed was that I wanted more impact startups. I think what I actually realized by talking to Justin was that I don't like people who are doing startups to get rich quick. Hmm. And I think at no point did we think we were going to get rich quick. <laughs> like get rich Definitely slowly with quick. agonizing pain. <laughs> I don't, I don't think we thought we were going to get rich. And so the quick part wasn't even part of the like, equation. And um, I think when I see this like kind of massive proliferation of pivotitis, it's like a symptom of people wanting to do this 
not enjoying the experience, but just wanting the end result. And I think I don't respect that. And so How it's often like, you see that, like what percentage of, of startups that you know, like apply to Y Combinator or you come across are like that? I'm really curious. Screw, screw apply to YC. Uh, probably 50% of the companies in any given batch are, you know, and, and it's hard for founders to be honest with themselves, right? But are in that mode where, um, and I don't blame them, right? I think that in a weird way, the startup world is becoming more attractive and kind of like, you know, like a moth to the flame. It's It's kind of falsely attracting these people when the reality is absolutely not a get rich quick scheme. Um, but yeah, I think a lot of them do. And you know, that saying that founders kind of quit and you don't get beat, you quit. That happens at YC all the time. And it's funny because there's so many stories that look a little like ours where the founders just didn't quit. And you know, years later, good shit happened. Um, so to me, I wish that more founders just were not in that motivation of getting getting rich quick and they liked their work. And whether that means they're building social media stuff or they're trying to reduce you know, mass incarceration, who cares, right? If you like your work, you're gonna do a good job and you stick with it and you'll eventually solve a problem. If you don't like your work, it's kind of like saying you wanna be an NBA basketball player, but like you don't wanna practice extra. It's like you're doomed from day one. Like, don't just don't even come on, man. The bar is so much higher than you're willing to even look, let alone reach. Like, don't even try it. Like, you're just gonna be disappointed or like, you know, that. And you know, the last point in this is with the proliferation of all this Robin Hood stuff and, and trading and crypto, like I kind of hope it's a brighter flame that kind of attracts these get rich quick folks and it's like oh yeah like you could build a product and flip it real fast but like you could also just click buttons on your phone and like buy dogecoin and fucking gamestop and you could be rich with just clicking go do that like please go over there <laughs> i can't wait to see the show 10 years from now that justin has where it's like all the dogecoin billionaires talking about how they came together and <laughs> yeah Oh, it's actually thick way and harder than and perseverance <laughs> built a great, uh, great, great enterprise or great value. Yeah, they're like, if I was hanging out on Wall Street bets and this guy's read this post and it really convinced me to go all in on Doge and I just put my thousand dollars in and today I'm a billionaire. I really worked hard for it. <laughs> we, can skip, we can skip that show then. It's already over. You just did it. I could have, I could have sold. I could have sold. I could have clicked the sell button, but I didn't. And then look what happened. <laughs> I, I was going to click the sell button and then, you know, I like went to get a beer and I forgot. And then I forgot I had it for like 10 years and, you know, now I'm a billionaire. <laughs> so, uh, I, oh, yeah. Go ahead, Justin. Was the, the original question was like, what kind of startups? Like startups are... are yeah. What, what if you, I mean, if you, I mean, you would, either you'd start a startup or like that you think someone else should start because you're too lazy, but you think it's a good idea. Um. Okay, here's the category of startup that I'm actually excited about right now. It, it, like, I'm probably the last fucking guy at the party, but I now I'm starting to see, like, there's something to crypto <laughs> as a way to dis. Did we talk about this last time? <laughs> crypto. I mean, Wait, Justin, you I think crypto might remember, be a but... thing? Yes, I Whoa. now think that crypto is going to be a thing. I know, ten years too late, twelve years or whatever, and. But specifically with social, with as a way to distribute the ownership for like different types of consumer apps. And I'm like really curious, like what it'll work for, you know, like as a way to like create a new organizational structure, basically as a way to innovate the organizational structure beyond like the traditional Silicon Valley equity structure. So that that's, mean, that's what I'm curious about and kind of researching now. Does that mean you're willing to transfer your entire net worth into NFTs? <laughs> time to it's i'm working on it right now wait this this is yeah this is not investment advice yeah i don't know kind of like if someone told you 10 years ago that, or 15 years ago that justin tv itself was going to be a billion dollar startup <laughs> like you would have been like people in silicon valley were just like this is stupid you know so yes. now i should go back and pitch all of those people on my nfts <laughs> You, you missed out once, the first but this time. You missed out, you missed out once, but this time you're not, yeah. You should you find a way to anonymously pitch Justin TV to investors today and see how they re react. 
Yeah. I mean, you could just get some other fool to do it. You know, like yeah. I've, I think that they, it's, it's very possible. I'm sure somebody has. See if they can like, get this guy had it wrong. Like, Hundred plus million pre-seed. That's the goal. Yeah, yeah ten million, ten on a hundred pre-seed. We're it's gonna have to invent the technology to do it. What about you, Kyle? What 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 startup or category of startups or set of problems that aren't being solved now should be solved by our world? Uh, well, I don't know what problems should be solved. Well, I actually have an opinion on that, but like I think. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you do. I was yeah. So so a couple. I, I you know I was like scrolling around on the CDC's website and like looking at things that kill people. So I think it's a good place to start for problems to solve. Yeah. Uh, or maybe it wasn't the CDC. I can't remember. Whichever whichever uh, government organization tracks like cause of death and things. And uh, like out of the top seven, I think like five of them had something to do with the food we eat uh, in some way, shape or form. So that seems like underexploited. And obviously with like, you know, companies like Impossible and I'm really into like um, cultivated or like, you know, um, synthetically generated meat stuff. I think that could be big. But beyond that, I think what's really interesting, which is just like it may be too early by a decade right now, is um, basically like think of it as like molecular machines, like using proteins as like the next form of programming. So today we program computers. I think that's like pretty well explored. I think in the future we're going to program proteins, and those can be like little tiny machines to assemble and build things, but also like get the human body to do whatever we want. Uh, and bridge the interface between obviously computers and humans, but also with diseases and health. And um, I think you can go pretty far down the rabbit hole, but I think that's way underexploited because the tech hasn't existed to do that. Like actually engineering a protein has been kind of guess and check. Imagine like if you uh, compiled a piece of code and it took like six months to know if it worked. That's kind of where we are in like biology today. But with uh, machine learning, like things like I think it's called AlphaFold, where basically for the first time you had a neural network that can predict how a sequence of you know DNA is going to fold into a protein. If that works, then now you can compile that code and get an answer in like you know ten minutes, and that's going to enable us to like build a new form of machines that affect the human body and the food we eat and you know even structures and, and things we build physically. So that I think could be huge, and it's like you know nature has mastered this, figured out how to turn atoms and DNA into machines way more efficient than anything that we've built, you know, on the macro scale that we do today with like welders and CNC machines. So I think that's the future, but it may be off by like 10 years. We'll see. <laughs> well, Ginkgo Bioworks is kind of like the first, you know, one of the first big companies that's doing that, right? Just went public, is going, announced yeah. they're going public by a SPAC this, this week or last week. Is that right? Another YC company. First bio yeah. investment we've ever made. Yeah. Yeah, that I love a, that. That was that was our first. That was the YC's first bio investment, yeah. and they're going public back in 2014. Yeah, yeah. boy, that's like that must have like a pretty good decision. Billion or 17 billion dollar valuation. Yeah, wow. You know, Kyle, like, I love that because I feel like tech is producing more cigarettes, or or fuck tech, the economy produces more cigarettes than I think I realize and I feel comfortable with. Like, it's so weird to grow up kind of, I think in a time where we grew up where cigarettes were just very roundly seen as harmful and bad for you. And like, and then when you look around you see like all these things that are kind of exactly like cigarettes that people don't talk about and that are like not maligned, you know, Coca-Cola is effectively cigarettes, right? Um, most forms of alcohol, um, effectively cigarettes. There's like a secret behind the alcohol industry, which is like alcoholics buying tons of alcohol and killing themselves. And like, it's weird how many cigarette industries are out there as opposed to the number of industries that like very clearly are anti-cigarettes. And like, man, like, like, wouldn't it be nice if our economy could like organically create anti-cigarette companies and like, but it seems really good at making cigarette companies. Like it seems really good at exploiting emotional and physical addictions and weaknesses that humans have to make money. And it's like, well, my fuck. theory. Yeah. That's, 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 that's human nature, right? Like my theory on it is that we're all running this uh, resource scarce algorithm from when we evolved in a resource abundant world. And so, you know, we're, 
we're not very good at self-control in across uh, the whole spectrum of stimulus, uh, whether it's like information on your phone or food or alcohol or sex or, you know, any of these things. And so it's, it's kind of like a, the intrinsic human problem in the human, in the, in the, uh, in the modern age, which is why, like my recommendation is that everybody should be fasting all the time. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yes, this is the the solution is we're just all going to become like monk like, and then the problem will go away because yes. we just need to like learn better self control as a society. I mean, don't get me wrong; it's probably good for the people who do it, but uh, I don't think it's a scalable solution. Um, unfortunately, the everyone get better self control approach has not historically solved many of these problems. Um, I think the like it's interesting. I really the cigarettes thing really resonated for me, but the specific thing is the way that technology like pulls us apart. I know it's a bunch of my bugbear, but like, I think that like, there's this intrinsic thing that like all technology does. You see it with smartphones, but it's true with like air conditioning. It's true from newspapers where like, it makes you more self-sufficient because it makes you more powerful. And, uh, our communities are reliant on interdependence and it's tearing our communities apart and people are ever less likely to have a strong community, to have like close friends, to, to feel, to be part of a tribe that they really feel like connected to. And like, uh, I think that's a specific air. It's like a, it's like the meta cigarette. It's the cigarette of like, it's the cigarette of technology that like, even the good stuff, like, it's hard to see air conditioning as like exploiting people's like, it's not addictive. It's just nice. People like air conditioning, but it nonetheless, I think, uh, like causes people to be less, uh, uh, less in connection maybe than they, than they could be otherwise in some ways. And so, I don't know, that's, 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 I would love to see more startups trying to directly address that problem. I saw this cool one, uh, uh, called quilt that seemed pretty dope, uh, that's sort of, you know, trying to, trying to directly address this sort of audio style features. Um, and, uh, I don't know, I think there's people starting to do it, but it's hard. I don't know, that's, that's what I wish we'd see more of. It's really hard. Cigarettes are, they work. Yeah. You stumble into a cigarette business model. It's like a black hole. It's hard to, to, to escape that. It's like, it's a felt relatively simple system. If you nail it, you make a lot of money. Uh, all your stakeholders are very happy. As long as like the general public doesn't think it's a cigarette. Like it's <laughs> Like, I, I actually wonder if the real play is some form of, like, a change in morality. Really? Mm-hmm. Like, 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 why are cigarettes bad? I think because the government ran ads, right? Like, it was like advertising. <laughs> like, you advertise that cigarettes are bad. Like, of course, they're bad for you. But why do we all think they're bad? Is because the government ran ads. It was like a weird world where, like, the government could just run ads that says, get off of social media. Huh. And, like... Get off of Instagram. <laughs> they must have figured that out because prohibition didn't work so well. So they must have gotten better no. at that. Well, making it illegal is not the right move, right? It's actually you make it legal and you just do ads. Because <laughs> this is America, right? It has to be available. We can just ridicule it like mercilessly. <laughs> like, <laughs> and then also so, they passed yeah. laws that said the cigarette companies can't do ads. So it's like yeah. the best yeah. set of laws. Information like we, control. Yes. We yeah. can run TV ads and you can't is like the, is the American way of changing our morality. <laughs> I thought you were going to go a different direction with, with this. I thought you were going to combine it with what Kyle was saying. And we were going to get like protein molecule computer cigarettes that make you healthier when you smoke them and are addictive. That's my startup idea. <laughs> 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 I mean, no, that's like kind of what Jewel was trying to do, except it wasn't actually like good for you. At best, you Boy, could say it's Jewel was. You. N- it's good for you. Jewel's you, good you for want you. an addi- yeah, addictive smoker, product with a positive side effect. Yeah, no, no. Right? I'm and saying it's, it's not. It's not good for someone. It doesn't. It doesn't make you healthier. Like, imagine if every time you Jewel, that like your like metabolism increased and your like chance of cancer went down. Because and here's what's like, interesting. I think Oculus has the potential for this. Like to me, it's always combining video, addictive video games, video games are very addictive and physical movement is like a very interesting combo. 
And like, you know, I personally lost a lot of weight, literally swinging my arms recklessly in the air with a fucking screen in front of my face. <laughs> do a Twitch stream of that, by the way, from the outside, just like you flailing around. I mean, I literally do this boxing game and the game tricks me into thinking I'm beating someone up and I really want to beat them up better. And the only way to literally the only way to do that is to be in better fitness. <laughs> like it's the only way. And it's funny because I play video games and I always love to find the cheap player or like the cheap move. But in a video game where you're swinging your arms, there's no cheat like the cheats swing your arm faster. Like that's the only cheat. <laughs> And so like, maybe like there are things like that, that could kind of be paradigm shifters. Maybe that's your healthy cigarette is a addictive movement product. Maybe for some people, Strava is like that. I don't know. Anyone a Strava user here? I like Strava. Or Peloton. Peloton. Yeah, this has got some game, like game mechanics to it. Like basically it, like when I used it, I got to the point where if I didn't post the workout on Strava, I felt like it didn't count or I didn't do it. So there's like that addictive behavior and positive with positive side effects. Like I weirdly wish that we taught that you can apply these addictive mechanisms to positive things. Like it's a, it's, you know, like, well, there's just two different visions of the future, right? There's like the addictive for good future, or there's the, like, there's like the, everyone becomes psychedelic mindfulness monks and no longer is compelled by addiction future. And then there's the, like, we 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 uh we have a new wokeness about addictiveness and morality police addictiveness out of the economy those seem like three possible you know like well, to be clear i'm i'm for the first two you know like maybe the third as well but like they i both want you to harness addictive you know things for your for your own benefit addictive uh patterns for your own benefit and become a psychedelic mindfulness monk so that it, they, the, your addictions no longer have sway over you. I feel like we just watched the preview for the rest of this simulation. Now I just want to hit fast forward and see how it ends. <laughs> <laughs> like 20 years from now, what's this going to look like? Emmett, the Jeff, I'm I'm think... down. what were your three things? It's addiction for good. Addiction becomes woke. Like addiction gets canceled. Right. Addiction and gets canceled. Yeah, that's, a, that's, that, that's a very good, that's a perfect summary. Addiction gets canceled. And then it's uh, everyone becomes a psychedelic mindfulness monk. And we no longer suffer from addiction. Oh, interesting. Like we transcend addiction. We transcend, transcend addiction, addiction because addiction. We, we get so good at like helping people gain control over their own behavior in a mindful way that they are no longer trapped by, they can see Compulsive the addictive the behavior and they can, and they can choose whether they would like to continue doing that or not. Can we, can we do a vote here? Pick one. Yeah. Are we voting for most likely or the world you want to live in? World you want to live in. Actually, both. Both. World you want to live in and most likely. Do you got to vote, Emmett? I mean, most likely, in my opinion, is clearly uh, addiction for good. I think that uh, I think it's unrealistic to, well, I think there will be certain addictions will get canceled. I don't think it's, there's too many of them and it's too profitable and you'll never cancel all of them. And even though we canceled cigarettes, Philip Morris Altura is like the be most profitable stock in the world over the past 80 years by like, it's like the best investment. If you go like, if you look back over like the last 80 or hundred years, it's like the single best investment. And so like, I just don't buy that. It's going to like happen. <clears throat> That'd be a really serious political movement. And then the mindfulness monks thing. I just don't think like, I just don't think there's realistic. Like, I, I, that would be, that's a beautiful dream in my opinion. Um, what do you think? Uh, I agree. Uh, I think it's the the addiction for for good. I think for two reasons. One is I think that's like effective. It's like you know, um, you have an addiction with positive side effects. That's like uh, you know, it can be self perpetuating because people don't kill themselves by doing it. And then secondly, uh, I think the most powerful entrepreneurs are ones that have like intrinsic motivation or believe that they're doing good. And I think they're going to defeat the ones who are doing it uh, out of pure profit seeking or because they're purely evil. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I think that's the most likely one. And, uh, one sec, and, we and won't I think do that'd the, be a fun one. What you want one yet. So just most likely. So we have addiction for good, addiction for good, Justin, most likely. Yeah, I agree with that. The addiction for good. Sure. That's the most likely. Okay. By the way, we don't say number four, which is maybe status quo, 
which is like addiction. Oh, yeah. Uh, status quo is the addiction most wins. <laughs> so you're saying, so it's like we can change our votes now. So addiction for bad, addiction for good, addiction gets canceled every chance at addiction. Emmett, what's your vote? What's most likely? So I was actually thinking, what's, sorry, what's the time horizon? Now, like 10 years, 20 years, 100 years? 100 years. 100 years. 100 years. Um, I actually think in 100 years, the answer is probably psychedelic mindfulness monks. See, that's nice. what I was going to say, Emmett. I agree with you because we'll have control over our minds. Once we have the BCI working, you know, we're just going to be able to turn off addiction. What's the BCI? like a brain computer interface though we're gonna we're gonna be able to turn off addiction and live our lives as psychedelic mindfulness monks kyle do you change your vote 100 years what's most likely that's a good point actually on the if addiction is purely a brain thing uh hmm. i mean unless you trip and fall on some heroin you're it's mostly a brain thing you know that's that's like not fair. I that's hate it when that card. happens. It's like with this piece of sci-fi, this problem goes away. I'm gonna take the. the well, other I just side I just this. put that in your mind. I don't know. It does might not you, exist, and then we'll you, you know you, you have to be a kind yeah. of psychedelic mindfulness monk, the hardware by like meditating all the time. <laughs> yeah, which oh, clearly wow. no one's gonna do. So I'm I'm gonna I'm still gonna go with addiction for good because I'm an eternal optimist, and I'm not gonna bet against human uh, ingenuity and in, in desire to you know do better things. Probably very naive, mm -hmm. but that's where I'm gonna go with this. Mm -hmm. And then Justin, are you most likely Psy psychedelic mindfulness monks by way of brain computer interface that allows us to turn off addiction? Okay. I, I have given each of these a political system. Addiction. Wait, Michael, okay. what's your vote? Uh, you have to choose. I don't, I don't know that I have one. Like my, my gut is it's addiction for good or addiction for bad. Like that, that's my gut. You don't think what we're about... defeating addiction. We're not defeating addiction. We're, we're embracing it and it might be good or bad. You're not sure between those two. That's fair. So for addiction for good is a capitalist utopia. Yeah, addiction that's right. Addiction for bad is a capitalist dystopia. Mm -hmm. Addiction gets canceled. That's socialism. Because uh, only a government, like socialism slash communism, like slash totalitarianism, <laughs> only a government could cancel addiction. And transcend addiction is libertarianism. It's like we're all free, floating, independent, not, you know. Um, yeah, I, I'm actually, you know, if I actually was forced to vote, I, I actually think addiction for bad is going to last another hundred years. Like, I, I wouldn't be surprised. I actually think it's a lot easier to make money that way. And I think more of the players are capital motivated than we would ever want to or care to admit. Um, and I actually think addiction for good is harder. Um, I think it's a lot harder of a problem. So All yeah, right, I well, think. And that's sad. That's a depressing right, so, outlook. So which, which world do you which world do you want to live in? And which world are we living in today? Addiction for bad we're, is the word. We're definitely, we're definitely living, living in addiction for bad today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Welcome to late stage capitalism, everyone. Uh, <laughs> uh, which one would I want? We want to live in the psychedelic mindfulness monks one. It's not get boring. That, that sounds pretty fun. I don't know. You, you just we're, control, we're, you know, you, you, you're, you have complete mastery over your, we all have complete mastery over our own minds because a combination of training, uh, like these, like a combination of like kind of uh, better training on, on all these mindfulness techniques, like mindful, mindfulness techniques, like uh, it's like Headspace Pro plus the BCI, which just beams it right into your mind is gonna make it so that everybody is living their like best life all the time and is in, you know, completely uh, has released all craving and aversion from their lives. It's going to be fun though. Like, I saw the matrix that like you can learn to fly a helicopter in like 30 seconds. Like that sounds awesome. Yeah. So I want to live in that world. It's going to make us like Vulcans. I don't want to be a Vulcan. I'm, I'm no, no, Michael. it's not going to be that. I want addiction for it's good. Like... I've never been happier than I've been trapped in a game designers, like perfectly designed system 
And if they have one of those that made me, instead of a fat, like sugar consuming person from a computer, a like super fit, like uh, socially well-adjusted person, because the thing's designed to force me to practice those habits, put me in the fucking game, baby. I want to like, I want to like, I want to be on the treadmill. Give me that hedonic <laughs> treadmill. The hedonic treadmill where I'm Everyone. always moving forward somehow. I just want to live in the Peloton studio. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, but the world's the world's best Peloton studio. The Peloton studio that just like it's like the AI like, Peloton studio is controlling studio, every yeah. aspect of your life. Yeah. Put me in, baby. Addiction for good is like the Federation. It's 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 capitalist utopia. It's like the Federation. And then and and addic addiction, yeah. transcend addiction is is uh yeah, it's like the Vulcans. Because I think once you transcend, emotion is going to feel stupid. It's like, oh, once I can control my brain, like, like it's going to feel stupid to feel anything. No, it's no, no feel I disagree with artificial. you. I, just, I disagree. It'll feel artificial to feel everything. It's, oh, that's just another stimulus. I shouldn't react. Like, no, and, and suddenly we'll become stoic. I, I I disagree. I think I think curiosity and exploration is an intrinsic part of the human uh, human experience. And so, you know, I often say like if you had the choice to come and live your human experience like feeling only joy, or you got the the second choice was to come and have you know the range of emo experiences and emotions, including like joy and sorrow and pain. Most I think people would choose the latter, you know, because they it's 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 interesting. You know, it's it's like a there's a richness of experience, and I think that that that's what the psychedelic mindfulness monks will choose. What happens? I if think the contrast there is actually defines like how much how, like how rich your life is. The the different the delta yeah. between your like you know greatest joy and you know lowest sense of defeat. Well, what happens if curiosity is tied to addiction? Like, what happens if motivation is tied to addiction? I could see that. And like you, you remove addiction, you remove curiosity and motivation, then it doesn't sound good. Well, I, I think it depends on what you're defining as addiction, because if you're saying like, you know, there's a reward, there are reward loops in everything, including, you know, things that give you intrinsic joy, uh, you know, like things that you, you're exploring for their own, their own sake. Yeah. And, you know, I do think there's like reward loops in the brain for that. And so I guess, you know, I, I, addiction, if you're like addiction, like the, the quality of like a feedback and, you know, uh, or sorry, like some sort of stimulus and then some action and response, whether it's inside intrinsic to you, things inside of you or things out, involves an external phenomenon, like that's like an intrinsic part of like the brain operating and it's in, in the environment. And so I feel like mm. that it's kind of like saying addiction, you, you could say it's like, there's no human beings without like some form of like feedback and and, and or like simulation and feedback you know fair like fair. Uh, i, I might don't think be, the brain is so fair it might it might no longer be a brain if it doesn't have that right so maybe no. that's another that's fair got our our, our gill arguments just no longer like bite in the same way good soft well now that's i know i know now it's now it's not as not as personal and the stakes aren't as high I do think, though, you guys could clown. argue in circles for another eight hours, given the opportunity. <laughs> Pretty convinced. All right. I, I, well, believe, I believe in us, too. I believe in us, too. <laughs> let's end it with one. Uh, Master Smith, Master Head of College Smith, uh, said that if you will it, it is no dream. And it's the, I thought it was the cheesiest shit at the time. It still probably is. But, like, I really feel like I uh, it stayed with me. You know, it stayed with me all these years, like, for uh whatever 20 years now and um really helped me as an entrepreneur just be able to think like oh like i can just do whatever i want and like it's possible i can do anything who's next i really think actually michael you gave me i think i mentioned earlier i think you gave me one of the best pieces of like clear just like actionable advice that like I've thought back on and used so many times, which is like, you can just call them on the phone. You can just talk to the other person, like ask them, you don't have to solve the problem yourself. And like that, it may sound like kind of stupid, but like that was like, that was actually revelatory for me. And like, I was, I was trapped in the cycle of trying to like 
feeling like I, I had to solve all the, and I, mean, I still have this issue where I feel like I have to solve all the problems myself, but like that opened up the idea that I could also do this other thing. Uh, that was, that was really a, that was a big deal. I think, um, for me, it's probably, uh, well, it's sort of a theme for tonight, but the people you work with is everything because the difference between a, a really good person who's uplifting and motivates you and can carry the load and, and sort of um, reflects your passion back at you and creates this positive feedback loop, the difference between that and someone who, when you talk to them, like the, the net energy level in the room decreases, like they, they pull that out of you and you end up having a really push to like, you know, bring this, you know, get, um, get this person motivated or, or get them to, to do things is immense. And, and that also applies for talent and complementary skills and everything else. Like can't do it alone. So people seem, seem to be like the most important thing in entrepreneurship get, get the, the right one or the right ones. And it's, uh, you know, hundred X your chance for success, get the wrong one. And it can tank you like in weeks. I think you guys taught me three things. One was good leadership doesn't mean being disruptive. Um, I remember Emmett had to explain to me that like programming was like doing really, really hard word problems that are really long. And like when Michael walks up and like ask a dumb question and like puts his finger on your, <laughs> it's mildly disruptive to that process. <laughs> Which didn't occur to me because there's almost nothing in my life that really you could fuck up by walking up to me and asking me a question. Like, I'm not doing any task that requires more than like 30 seconds of thought at a time. <laughs> so, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> What's going on with that? <laughs> totally fine. It's like I've learned to answer emails in less than 10 seconds of thought. So like you could really interrupt at any moment. It's fine. I think the second thing that you guys taught me and what was so cool about being in the room with you guys was this idea that like software and engineering are the core, like they're the engine of change and like ideas and like business guys and spreadsheets aren't. And like, even though I was never a programmer, like I, I bought into the religion of it. And like, that was cause of you guys. And that was cause like, weirdly we weren't separated. Like when you all were debating how to build something or why it's broken, it was always, we were always, I, I wasn't really contributing, but I was in the room. <laughs> I, I still remember the pieces of paper up on the walls all over the office. Did you check, Did you the, check file the file descriptor, descriptor limits? <laughs> because Michael didn't know what that meant, but he knew it kept being a problem. We kept forgetting to do it. And so he printed out these pieces of paper and just put them everywhere, which in fact did help us solve the problem faster. A rat doesn't understand it's in a maze, but it does know if it makes the same right and left terms every time there's cheese at the end. <laughs> it's actually funny that there were times literally when you looked at the sign and were like, oh, did we check the file descriptor limits? And then that was the problem. <laughs> Which by the way, I think makes me the best like bug fixer because I predicted the bug and pre-posted the answer in front of you. <laughs> Which Absolutely. I think, I think right under that, did, did you vacuum the database? That was the other one. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I think the third one, and a lot of this comes, I think, Justin, in our interaction, is how efficiently do you convert money or resources into happiness? And that the engine to optimize isn't the money engine. It's the efficiency of the conversion of money into happiness. And like so many mm. people know are rich, but that engine is broken through something going on with them. Usually something deeper, like something happened to the kid or something that's more of like a, a, a mental health issue. And then like, it doesn't really matter how much money you make if that, whatever the technical term for that, you know, if that conversion is inefficient, you'll never be happy. And if that conversion is efficient, you'd be shocked at how relatively less money you need to be relatively more happy than people who are richer than you. And, you know, I think that was, that was something that has, has like, 
don't know. I just think we've had a lot of conversations about this kind of thing, Justin. And like, it, it really made me feel like, you know, the quippy version of this is like, don't count the money you didn't make. But it's like more serious than that. It's kind of like, like, you might be a lot happier in your current situation if you can fix that engine. Um, that might be the most important thing to fix as opposed to how much money you have or how much earning potential you have. Um, so yeah, those are my three. That's a, that's a beautiful thought. I can't take credit for it, but I, yeah, I love it. Um, all right. That's it. Thanks guys for coming on. This, this is a great convo. We'll do it again next time, whenever that is. And, uh, thanks for watching. I tell myself, you know what if I, I don't, Oh, check it out. See, growing it out is the way to go. Except then if I look like this, then it's like Game over. You can see it. Just, <laughs> just I'm basically have a comb over right here. That's disgusting. Yeah. Kyle's got the solution. That's how comb overs oh, that's no, how comb no, overs no, happen. Kyle. Kyle, we need that hat off and I, I want a hair check here. I need a, a quick you think I've you think I've lost it? No. That's what it looks. Oh, Kyle, uh, oh, oh, the the ring still has it. Oh, looks good. The secret to anti aging is contained in that man's genes. Yeah. <laughs> What's the, why the microphone? Like, why do all the professional podcasters have the big mic in front of their face? There'll be a lot of background noise. So you want it to basically be as close to your face, not too close, but like one fist from your face. Uh, so that it picks up mic like- set up to give you this voice actor voice or you've been practicing? You should buy, like Gary has it all on his kit.co, which is kind of like where you can list gear and stuff. Right. And he has instructions. So I basically bought everything that Gary recommended with like a few tweaks based on like, I already mm -hmm. had a few pieces, but I mostly bought right. everything that Gary recommended and it just works. That's exactly what I did. Yeah, Gary's, Gary's the man. Or rather he's wasted uh, days and hours trying to figure this out waste. so we don't have to. <laughs> he's, he's wasted a lot, exactly, exactly. Um, Okay, so every, is everyone right. recording their audio? Does everyone have headphones on? No, yes. but I don't usually have headphones and it seemed to have worked so far. <laughs> I mean, yes. Absolutely. <laughs> okay, if, you mean, every person you talk you to is like, well, why is this asshole echoing and not doing anything about it? He's been working from home for a year. <laughs> no, the problem, yeah. if you don't have headphones, the problem is that it will, it will when we try to, because when they edit the audio tracks, like everybody else will appear in yours. Has that been the issue in the last two times? Yes. <laughs> no, I no they have I microphones. Have microphone. they, they have microphones. Oh, never mind. That's just yeah. me then. <laughs> I got this yeah. thing. They have, have microphones. Fucking, they just I don't, don't have, have, I don't have it like right up in my mouth. So now I know. Yeah, 